uh, try and keep it reasonably. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, I'm being recorded, so I better watch my mouth. Um, all right, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. I'll do a, a quick intro. My name is uh, Neil Fultz. I'm a uh, statistical slash data science consultant in Los Angeles. Uh, I think I met Ted when I ran a book club last year uh, on the Halvarian book, Information Rules, which is uh, not a technical book. It's more of a technology kind of uh, economics book. Um, what else? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> we'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, maybe, maybe some personality will come out that way. So I'm going to share my screen and, I don't know, kind of point at some stuff and we'll... Uh, We'll go from there. Uh, so theoretically, this is getting shared, and you all can see my my book and uh, some some Chrome tabs. I always like to keep those, uh, you know, kind of ready for reference. And then I will mostly be looking at the page. Uh, but uh, yeah, so sections 2.3 and 2.4, uh, just to give a high level uh, overview. So Gaussian joint distribution and some stuff. Quite a bit of stuff actually, and 2.4 is, uh, and also if I'm writing off the bottom of the camera, someone say so. Um, yeah, 2.4 is exponential family, which uh, is kind of a generalization of uh, a bunch of different distributions. Is there a 2.5? I thought there was. Yeah, there we go. 2.5, transformations of random variables. And then I think that's the last one. Oh, there's a couple more. I might have a hard time getting through all of them, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. Uh, what is this? Oh, Markov chain, also a good topic. Um, and then 2.7, I think is the last one. Convergence measures. Uh, yes, and then that's it. So that is chapter two. It is a, I don't know, quite kind of a chunky section, but that's okay. I think we'll we'll kind of just try and hit the high high note. So so uh, first thing I kind of notice is that he's kind of doing his own thing with notation. So I wanted to like mention just a couple things in case you're referencing this against like uh, other stuff. Um, so first thing is that what what he is writing right here, where it's like this uh, normal x given like mu and sigma. Um, so he he's using this like uh, script n in a couple different places. Down here he uses it in a, a little bit different way. So you would read this as x is a random variable that's normally distributed with a mean and a covariance versus here. He's kind of done it a different way where he's like writing out the CDF. Usually what you would see is you would see this written with uh, with this Greek letter. I think it's uh, capital Phi. And then that thing takes a, a standard normal variant. So, so when you're standardizing, that's just X uh, minus your mu over your sigma, right? So, so this kind of thing you see a lot in like intro stats classes, um, stuff like that. Uh, so just want to make that connection if if you all are referring to other things. Um, he brings up Mahalanobis distance right away, and that pops up later. Uh, the only other comment I wanted to have is, uh, you know, it is this thing in the middle of that uh, of that density function right there. Um, so that that kind of indicates its importance. The other thing I would mention is if you're looking at a linear algebra book. Uh, you might notice that there's this relationship between, uh, they call it a vector norm with respect to a matrix. So, you know, that's also going to be written something like this. So it's the X minus mu. So this is kind of like the errors with respect to the covariance matrix. So this is something that you might also see it. Um, but yeah, um, so this is just kind of like the little notation of the stuff where he's defining the different uh, different kind of objects he's going to be talking about. And then he gets really into um, 
some interpretation. Uh, next part he talks about is Gaussian shells and the Gaussian soap bubble um, phenomena. And he has kind of a neat picture there uh, where it's basically like, uh, I don't know, most of your variation is not going to be um, right on top of uh, your mean. And it gets more and more so as you like have a, a higher number of dimensions. So I hadn't seen this before, but I'm like kind of shocked that he wrote this whole whole thing without using the phrase curse of dimensionality, because I think it's the same thing. Uh, and curse of dimensionality is as the number of dimensions gets bigger, uh, things get more and more difficult. Um, so there's usually square roots of n's coming in somewhere. And here we can see a square root of d coming into play over there. So. That's kind of the stuff I was looking for. Um, hey, can yeah. I make a quick comment about oh, yeah, definitely. this little section? So yeah. uh, um, all the time I see these, uh, these image generation models, right? Mm -hmm. These diffusion models, and you start with Gaussian noise. And I mean, we all know what this looks like because if, you, if you're old enough to have had like an old TV and just have like no signal and there's just like snow on the TV, that, that's what it looks like. So of course, like it seemed obvious to me, but only when I read this did it become really clear to me that like, well, yeah, like the mean of this distribution would be a nice solid 50% gray square. It wouldn't actually be this whole fuzzy snowy thing. And then it's like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, it's because of this curse of dimensionality. It's because the majority of the points aren't actually near the mean. The majority of the points are on this whatever ring, sphere-ish, you know, donut um, a distance away from the mean. That's why when you sample, you almost never get a nice, even, smooth 50% gray square. You get this snowy thing. Right. So, yeah. I think that's like uh, kind of an interesting point. I've always wondered, like, because um, there's lots of types of random, and like Gaussian is like a specific type. I wonder, like, is the snowy type on TV is that actually the same as the snowy type is Gaussian, or is it like some slightly different thing? But like, our eyes are only picking up on that yeah. that type and not able to quite tell the difference because it's it's too noisy or something like that. Good point. Uh, it may not be the exact same thing, yeah, but at yeah. least like it, it gives that intuition in terms of like, uh, but but like you know other things like if you did a a one dimensional Gaussian, like you would not expect that. You would expect a lot of points to be really close to the mean, you know. Yeah. So so this is this is a different phenomenon where like yeah, again, two fifty six by two fifty six image is how many tens of thousands of pixels. And so there are going to be ones of them that are very dark and ones that are very bright and nowhere near 50% gray. So. Right. So, yeah, so that's, that's that example. Um, and I guess uh, the example comes from Eric Nelisnik. Uh, so, he might be someone to, to look up on Google Scholar, see if he's done anything uh, nifty. Um, but the next part is just some more kind of algebra on your, your MVN um, density function. So first thing they do is, uh, so this is all supposed to be you know a vector, but what he's doing is split it into two parts, so an x1 and x2. Uh, these are still all vectors, but it's like a, a vector concatenated with itself. And then kind of the, the trick here, and there's a, a proof in a following section, is that if you, uh, if you just like take a, a certain uh, set of variables in there, uh, those are themselves MVN. So if you were, uh, for example, working on a pandas data frame and you knew it was MVN, uh, and you subset down a couple columns, those are still MVNs just with a little block there. So it's good to know. Um, the other part that is kind of getting into more interesting places is the conditional distribution, uh, which the conditional distribution of one chunk of variables on the other chunk, uh, still MVN. Um, so that's also in that proof. Uh, the other thing, just to like kind of expand this out a little bit, 
because I think most people have seen like simple linear regression before. Um, so covariance of one, two, like if, if we're just in a, a two variable setting, we would rewrite that as the correlation times the standard deviation of X, standard deviation of Y, divide out by the covariance of X. So standard deviation of X squared. So those things cancel. So this is like your, your kind of standard formula for your beta hat. So correlation times the ratio of the variances. So that's right in there. But what he's done is he's written this in kind of a block matrix format. So you can see you got a, a bunch of coefficients all at once. Um, so that's cool. And same thing over there for the covariances, same kind of trick. Um, yep. So this is where I feel like the the chapter starts feeling not sequenced quite right. Uh, so he's talking about the, the natural parameterization of this. Uh, and the natural parameters, like for me, always go back to like the, the exponential family, which comes in the next section. But this is about the MVN, so he put it here, I guess. Um, so he doesn't like spend a lot of time talking about like how this thing factors nicely or whatever. But basically, he does talk about um, you've got these etas, which are kind of like, I would describe these as like standardized because we're dividing out by our uh, our variance covariance matrix times times our means. So these things don't have any units. I think that's uh, worth thinking about. Um, yeah. Natural parameters. This kind of thing uh, can be a useful trick, kind of depending what you're what you're doing. Um, okay, so so when you said that, I just got that. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. So in the in the univariate case, then right. that eta would just be your mean divided by your standard deviation. Yeah, the coefficient of variation, as it's called. Okay. Because that actually has some intuition in my head, whereas when I saw this sigma inverse mu, it didn't click. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, and yeah, people feel free to, to pop in. Uh, I do have the, the chat box open on my other screen, so I'll try and catch those. Um, but like I say, I think this is something that will probably We'll talk about exponential family and then we'll flip back and it'll make more sense. But the derivation stuff does, which is kind of down here, uh, does have some nice kind of linear algebra tricks. So like inverting a, a block matrix, this is something that I've had to use in my career before. Uh, so he calls it, I don't know, M equals EFGH. Uh, and then he kind of goes through the flipping it. <laughs> So the inverse ends up being this. Um, I don't think anyone would ever want to like memorize this kind of like chunk of formulas, but basically what he did was Gaussian elimination with respect to a particular uh, set of columns. And so he he's come up with this slash notation, um, which depending on what you read uh, is kind of uh, like a solve sort of. Um, then he calls out the sure complement. Uh, so that's how he says it. So M slash H is sure complement of M with respect to H. Uh, da, da, da. And so the, the important thing here, at least when it's come up in my, my career is so if we have our, uh, you know, M equals E F G H. So if, when you're looking at this, you've got this H inverse here. That that's not helpful. But if H has some like nice structure, if H is a diagonal thing, then the inverse is a lot easier. You don't have to go through all this. So that's one thing I'd call out. The second thing I would call out is that this thing does work recursively. So if inside of H you have other block matrices or whatever, you can do this thing again on it and recurse it down. Um, so there's that. Um, and they talk about uh, Sherman, Morris, and Woodbury formula. Uh, so you can use this to do rank one updates of 
these kinds of objects uh, pretty easily. So it doesn't have to be rank one, but rank one is kind of the standard way it's, it's introduced. Um, okay, so they do all that and then, then, then they're like, okay, in fact, so that's the, that's the important part. Um, or derivations of information forms. I think we can probably skip that, uh, at least for now. Okay. Um, linear Gaussian systems. Uh, this kind of thing is like, uh, I don't know, pretty close to my heart anyway. Uh, so this is useful to call out. Uh, so joint distributions. Uh, Oh, so so one other thing I noticed is that he hadn't actually like ever like oh, see in chat to make it bigger. Let's see if we can zoom a little. How's that? Okay, cool. Uh, okay. So like for for some of these things, like he hasn't defined like an expected value of a random variable or a variance or all these other kind of typical things you could do. I would assume that's like in his first book. And so he just was like, well, you already read the first book, so I don't need to talk about it again, but maybe not. Um, but a lot it's, of these things- It's that... actually coming up in the MLE section. Oh, uh, the okay. In the maximum likelihood, so in the later section of the chapter, he does a derivation book. Okay. Yeah, well, he's- definitely refer to it, but like when you have stuff like this, it's like a little bit more intuitive than, than how these things are written. Um, so, you know, uh, if you have your, uh, your Z is just your normal random variables and then your, your Y is kind of, uh, you know, a, a affine transformation of those, then the, the joint distribution is also Multivariate normal conditional is also multivariate normal, all of that. Uh, but I don't know. I always learned it in terms of these things instead of thinking about these kinds of formulas. So that's that's my opinion. If it's coming up, then yeah, we'll we'll call it out and circle back. Um, all right, Bayes rule for these things. This is a a fun one, but yet you know, yet again, like. You do this stuff on a multivariate normal and it stays multivariate normal. <laughs> um, and this is because a Gaussian is a conjugate prior of itself. It's the only distribution that's like that. Um, and I think he's talked about that before, but basically a conjugate prior is like, uh, um, you know, uh, kind of the, the distribution of the parameters. Um, and then the distribution of the data are kind of like, I don't, I, I don't know, like cousins of each other or whatever. And so if you get new data in that, that kind of adjusts your, your parameters, distribution and vice versa. So um, that Gaussian very common one, uh, if we get into like, I don't know, hierarchical models or something like that, having everything be Gaussian makes these things kind of like tractable in ways that having other distributions is a little more difficult. So, uh, yeah. And then uh, he talks about uh, some common stuff in here. I was a little less interested in that, but it does come up once in a while if you're doing like uh, HMMs or state space models. I think there's another meetup uh, that Ravine is doing that's gonna go more into that if that's something you're super into. Might be good to check out. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, sensor fusion with known measurement noise. Uh, did this this one land on anyone? No. So I think. Yeah, the idea is is to kind of do like a weighted average of a couple different observations and then it ends up being sensor fusion or something like that. And then you get a kind of a cleaner estimate at the end of everything. So if so if you have equally reliable sensors, you get kind of you know 
equal circles. If sensor two is more reliable, then it's going to have more weight and pull things over. And if sensor one is more reliable in one direction, then it's going to be tight in one dimension and wide in the other. So well, might need to think through that more. But then we get back to some of the other stuff. Um, so moments for uh, Gaussian right, distribution. Can you, yep. can you pause before there? So at yeah. the bottom of the previous page, when yes. he introduces section 233, yeah. uh, it's, it's the second line. He says, the key is to define joint distributions over the relevant variables in terms of a potential function. And I was wondering if you could sort of explain how he's using the term potential function or I don't know, I, I didn't quite, I just didn't quite understand how he's saying that. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that word exactly. Like, uh, you know, in my training, we would probably call it like a likelihood function. And I think he's trying to avoid that word for a reason. Is that, is that true? Like he doesn't want to, doesn't want to go there because maybe he's uh, a Bayesian or maybe not. Um, yeah. So, so they, can I they, just? I guess this represented in information form might be an important thing to to point out um, or not. <laughs> So if I even forget the adjective, what is a function represented in information form? Yeah, so the, the information form was using the natural parameters of the distribution and not the easy to use ones, if I recall correctly. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, back, back here he had uh, information slash canonical form um, using the natural parameters. So, all right, thanks. Yep. And then it looks like, uh, yeah, so this is just the derivation that shows that, uh, that we get this thing and then we get this thing. Um, so that's an easy ish proof. Um, notice he started using that little fee there. Um, then he wants to talk about multiplication and division. To multiply this by that, we extend both to the same domain by adding zeros to the appropriate dimensions and then computing this thing. Let me just make sure I'm reading this correct. Okay, so yeah, so for multiplication, these guys add the H's are the, uh, the coefficients of variation and the K's are the inverse of the variance covariance matrices. And uh, division is turns into the difference. And this is because all of this stuff is up here in an exponential, right? So when you multiply Exponential send the powers add or subtract. So I think I get that. Um, marginalization. Uh, this is just integrating out some some nuisance variables. Uh, so we'll just kind of skip forward and see what we get. So we get these things, and again. Uh, just, just want to call out, this looks very similar to like a kind of a regression thing. So we've got our intercept and our slope, and the slope is a function of the, of, in this case, they're, um, the input um, precisions. So that's kind of, uh, you know, everything ends up being like a, a linear projection or something. Um, then conditioning, uh, yeah similar kind of thing, I think. So, uh, 
da, da, da. Anything else in this part that I wanted to call out? No, I don't think so. Yeah, let's just roll on forward to the exponential family stuff. I think that's a little bit more interesting. Uh, so exponential family uh, is kind of something that definitely comes up if you're taking like mathematical statistics. I'm just going to pull up the Wikipedia page because I think it's nice to refer to, to both of these. Um, so he's got kind of his discussion of it. Eh. Let's go back up to the top. But like all of the distributions that he introduced previously, basic, basically all of them are exponential family. Um, he also um, you know, calls out some other properties. So it's uh, as maximum entropy and has, hence makes the least set of assumptions subject to some user chosen constraints. I'll discuss that. It's at the core of GLMs, which is discussed in section 15.1, and also at the core of variational inference, which is in chapter 10. So this is some of those forward pointers we were talking about really far in the future. Um, uh, under certain conditions, it's the only family of distributions with finite sized sufficient statistics. So that's kind of like a uh, important kind of thing to, to know, right? Like uh, if you have a data set and you want to summarize it with sufficient statistics, like you, you want it to have like uh, a finite number of sufficient statistics. You don't want the number of, of sufficient st statistics you need to grow as like the, uh, as your data set grows, as you collect more and more data. Uh, and then a final final point he makes is if it's exponential family, then the conjugate uh, exists. Uh, not sure if the conjugate prior has to also be exponential family or not. We'll have to watch out for that. Uh, yeah, and then he gives his definition here, uh, which does match up with the one on Wikipedia. Uh, kind of the, the important thing is that uh, it splits up our, uh, our likelihood function in a very specific way. We've got this H, which only depends on the X. We got this uh, A of eta, which only depends on eta. And then the relationship between the transformation of X and the eta's is this very specific dot product thing, right? Um, and so if you can rewrite uh, you know, your, your, your probability uh, distribution in this format, then, you know, all of the nice stuff that we can say about exponential families applies to that, because that would be a special case. So that's kind of like, I don't know why mathematicians have kind of pursued this, is that we can work on this kind of, you know, general kind of object, and then all those other distributions that I flashed up there on Wikipedia, like we can do with the same stuff to all of them. You can do do the same thing to a normal distribution as a chi-squared or a gamma or a binomial or whatever. Uh, and that's why GLMs kind of work. Um, yeah. So HX is a uh, uh, scaling con constant. Uh, the, the TXs are the sufficient statistics. Etas are the natural parameters and uh, the, the A of eta is the log partition function. And so he has some, some kind of a discussion around those. Um, let's see. Oh. So then you can also generalize it by defining uh, eta equals a function of which one is that? That's not a theta. That might be another phi. Um, and so we get a couple explanations on that. And we also get the, the moment parameter of this thing. 
expected value, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, yeah, have people seen um, the this exponential family stuff before? It's been a little while for me, but this is like, I don't know, reasonably familiar, or at least the the parts of it I needed to know in grad school or whatever. So, uh, hey, but if you, you mentioned, yeah, uh, uh, you mentioned that there are some uh, distributions for which the conjugate prior is not exponential. Do you know which ones? I somehow the only ones that I remember were all exponential functions. But maybe I don't know the gamma and beta distribution. I don't know what their prior would be. <laughs> yeah. So um, so over here on Wikipedia, we could probably get some get creative with these kinds of things and come up with some examples. So. Uh, you know, in, in here it says uh, a number of common distributions are exponential families, but only when certain parameters are known and fixed. So, for example, binomial with fixed number of trials or negative binomial with fixed number of failures. So if those parameters were not fixed, um, I believe the conjugate would still be the same. Maybe not. Um, without this thing being uh, exponential family itself. But, it, you know, I'll, I'll leave that as an exercise for the for later or whatever, because I'm not not totally clear. That's that's just my intuition, though, is that, uh, you know, if it's in exponential, the conjugate has to exist. But I'm not not sure if the conjugate itself has to be in the family or not. So great question, though. Um, oh, and then other common distributions that are not one of these things, T distribution, right? Um, most mixture distributions, uniform distribution, they have a whole section on these things uh, below. Let me just uh, control F for conjugate. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, so let's see. Exponential families have conjugate priors. Uh, the posterior predictive distribution, which is um, the prior and the, the observation uh, multiplied together, can always be written in closed form, uh, provided that the normalizing factor can itself be written in closed form. Uh, okay. Did I have anything else to say on this topic? Um, gen generally in nature, exponential functions do come up quite often. Uh, yeah. So, for example, if you're detecting photons from an, a light emitting object, and you count the, if you count how many photons you have, that's that's a Poissonic distribution. But what happens is, say you want to calculate the rate or the time it takes between two photons. And you mm -hmm. plot that time, then that ends up being more of an exponential function. Uh, so it, it depends on, on like, so these arise uh, from natural phenomena quite, and they're very useful. Right. And I think there's like a lot of, uh, they're called like compound distributions that are like that. So if we look at the, like the gamma Poisson. is a negative binomial apparently uh good to know um so there that's in there and that's probably the part where it's uh a little different from the standard formulation uh, another another example of that would be like a beta binomial um so this is like the uh, the posterior predictive distribution for for coin flips instead of counts, but. Uh, just on the note of using the uh, terminology potential, um, uh -huh. it's also typically used in, uh, in graph analysis, uh, okay. where instead of saying uh, probability of going from node A to node B, you say, what's the potential? How much do I have to overcome to go from you know point A to point B? Um, okay. uh, and 
a, a lot of times the covariance matrix actually it's really hard to interpret how the how the nodes are connected. So if you put it in a form of the if you take the inverse of that, which is the precision matrix, you start to see very easily the the condition conditionality and that it's clear to draw graphs from that. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of cases where um you know, maybe the inverse of the covariance matrix is a lot sparser than the the regular one, and so that makes it easier to interpret for sure. Um, yeah. Well, I'm gonna keep rolling along. Um, okay, so this is example of Bernoulli distribution as a special case of exponential family. Uh, important thing or thing to watch for in the future anyway is a uh, couple things here he's using indicator functions so that's gonna come up in other things i'm sure and then the other thing is there's our logic transformation and our uh, logistic things these are inverses of each other um so we'll be seeing those a lot at the minimum we'll be seeing them in whenever a logistic regression comes up because it's going to be built on top of this thing, right? So uh, there's that. Uh, then we extend by um, Bernoulli rather into the categorical distribution. Doesn't change too much. Uh, big thing here is oh, this thing goes from like a, a one over the negative E. It's just a thing. Uh, uh, categories score over the sum of the scores. And, uh, you know, this is the, the soft max. So there we go. Um, oh, uh, other thing I would call out is that, um, you know, with multi multinomials in the, the GLM, there's uh, I don't know, in the 90s or whatever, there were software issues with those things. It was not not a very uh, well-supported distribution early on, which kind of drove some of the, the research into neural networks originally. So if you ever re are using like the NNet package in R, which is by uh, Brian Ripley, that was kind of written so that you could do stuff with this <laughs> because the regular logistic regression didn't wouldn't extend correctly. So, um, okay. Here's our univari univariate Gaussian. So this is the, the D equals one special case of MVN. And then we get our, uh, our different uh, natural parameters. So there's that uh, coefficient of variation. Oh, it's not quite the coefficient of variation because we got a two there. So that's uh, worth worth remembering. Um, so there's those. Uh, with the known variance, it's a little different. Uh, multivariate Gaussian. So we build it up from, uh, from here. Do some stuff. Come on. Oh, this is some good Good vocab, so precision matrix and precision weighted mean vector. So that's what we should call them, um, not whatever words I'm pulling out of the hat. Um, okay, non-examples. So these are also good to know. Uh, student T distribution, Wikipedia mentioned that. Uh, uniform distribution, Wikipedia also mentioned that. Uh, and he says it's tempting to think it's exponential uh, but the support is not quite right uh, because it depends on the width of the uniform distribution, which violates one of the assumptions. Uh, okay. And there's a section on cumulants. Do we want to go over those? I mean, we can. Um, cumulants are kind of like, uh, they're, they're like moments, only a little bit different kind of like the moments of the centered series. Um, yeah. Is this how he introduces expected value and variance, though? 
Oh crap, it is. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so yeah, instead of starting with that old formula, E of X is X, P of X, DX. So this is the normal way you get to it, but uh, here he's, he's getting to it through the, uh, through the cumulants. So it's got his exponential family in there uh, and kind of does the chain rule with the derivative all the way through. So that's some, some calculus you can kind of stare at if you like calculus. Uh, right, so, so this thing is the same as that thing. Uh, so that's cool. And then if we follow this back up here, this is kind of the interesting part. So this is the derivative of A with respect to eta is gets us that thing. Uh, and then second thing is that if we take the derivative again, we get the variance, which is variance of x is uh, x minus. Hey, Neil, the uh, equation on line six, seven and six is kind of off the screen a bit. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Equation. Okay. Yeah, it zoomed in a little, so we're uh, uh, a little compressed. So this is kind of like, uh, I don't know, an interesting kind of fact about exponential families is the say function is important too. And uh, when you do the derivative on it, you start getting the, uh, you know, these kind of important features of the distribution, the expected value, the variance and so on. Um, I don't think I remembered this part too well, so let's, Good to see a refresher. Um, this this might be a good trick that pops up later. In fact, I'm sure it will if he goes through a derivation of the of the GLM. So something to watch for. Um, oh, and Fisher information matrix. So uh, I'm gonna just try to read this thing because <laughs> this is kind of a a lot, right? So the Fisher information matrix of the Etas, which are um, natural parameters, is defined as the expected value given the likelihood of the gradient of the log probability uh, cross productized. So for, and then that is the same as the negative expected value of the second derivative of the log of the probabilities. So that's. Cool. Um, and for the exponential family, it so, all ends up being the covariance of the natural, of the, what are the T's, the transformations? Yeah. So, uh, uh, Neil, yeah. how, how can we relate this 2.433, the Fisher information matrix to some real world examples? I mean, I, I think it will help correlate to some example, mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you know top of your head. Yeah, so, um, okay, well, just off the top of my head, so I'm seeing the name Fisher, so I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that he did. He's known for linear discriminant analysis, among other things. He also did, like, ANOVA, um, I don't know, split plot designs, a lot of, lot of stuff. But in linear discriminant analysis, you have, like, a, a mixture of two different classes, um, of multivariate normals, right? So this this is what like the iris data set was originally collected for. He had three kinds of flowers and then he measured uh, the length, width, and something of the petals of the flowers. Um, and then when you um, when you do the maximum likelihood estimation, it's it's the same as optimizing the information matrix. I, I remember this part of it. Um, so like this kind of thing ends up in the in the center of a lot of stuff. And it, uh, another thing is if you're doing maximum likelihood estimation, um, like this kind of thing ends up defining the, um, the standard errors that you would use later on if you're if you care about like uh, confidence intervals and that stuff, this this thing pops up there also. So it kind of defines like uh, 
uh, I don't know, like the curvature or the peakedness of that likelihood surface when you're when you're maximizing it. So I don't know. Does that sound plausible? It's been a few years. Uh, just driving Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that may be helpful. Thank you. Let's go to that. Fisher information matrix. And then the only reason I kind of paused, I mean, everything else was also important, but this we will come across several times, so. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so the reason they call it an information matrix is it's the Hessian of the relative entropy. Um, so that's good to know. Um, at the top, oh, yeah. Sorry, at the top of this Wikipedia page, there's some, you know, interesting information. Okay, basically, we'll go up there. Basically, it says, you know, if you have a random variable and you want to um, estimate a parameter, mm -hmm. then, um, then the information, um, Fisher information is the amount of information that is observable. Hmm. So in parameter estimation, I think this would be useful. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, and you can use it to calculate covariance matrices from an MLE that gets used for a bunch of different hypothesis tests. Uh, it pops up when you're talking about uh, Jeffrey's rule, which I think is, yeah, Jeffrey's prior, same thing. So this is, this guy uh, kind of invented the, the idea of shrinkage, if I recall correctly. Um, but maybe that's a different thing that he also did. Um, so that's in there. What else? What else can we say about Fisher information other than just the just the definition itself? Um, so, Neil, um, yeah. when you do linear regression. Right. Um, isn't it something where if your Fisher information um, is low, then then basically uh, you know you're trying to find the maximum, but it's a very flat, wide, mm -hmm. um, and, and and so if you're if you're doing whatever numerical methods, then you you might be off. Whereas like you're saying, if it's very narrow and peaked, then then you know you're going to have a very accurate parameter estimate, something like that. Yeah, that sounds right to me. Um, I think um, I'm going to pop down to properties and see if there's anything fun there. Um, okay, Fisher Fisher information has a chain rule, so that can occasionally be be useful. Um, let's see, uh, Fisher information depends on the parameterization. Uh, so that's also something to watch out for, uh, and that's why you might want to prefer the, the etas over the thetas, uh, because then you have to chain rule it through, and that that thing could be uh, a little tricky or ill-behaved. Um, oh, here, here's applications. There we go. Uh, design of experiments. So you want to uh, minimize the variance, which corresponds to maximizing the information. It is like a good thing to always remember. Um, comes up in computational neuroscience, um, the joint responses of many neurons representing a low dimensional thing, such as a stimulus parameter. Okay, and some physical laws, uh, but this has been disputed, okay. And uh, in machine learning, uh, it can use it for elastic weight consolidation, which reduces catastrophic forgetting. Catastrophic forgetting sounds bad, so uh, yeah. Cool. I don't know. I, we got like uh, 7 o'clock. I forget how long we go. There's still three more sections. I can keep plowing ahead and see how far we get. Yeah, so so I did schedule this for an hour and a half, so till okay. 730, because I knew that in one hour we were very unlikely to get far in any given week, but yeah. we still may not finish. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Um, 
So yeah, so that's all these. And okay, then we get MLE for the exponential family. Um, so again, the reason we're doing this for exponential family is that uh, you know once once we do the der derivation once, then it applies to every single uh, distribution in the family, right? They're all just special cases of this thing. Uh, versus if you're taking a undergraduate mathematical statistics class, they will have you write out every single different one as a different homework problem, and then you you know take the derivative and solve it. Um, so many, many problem sets of that form, but, or you can just do it once and then you're good forever. Um, so this is why exponential family is kind of cool. Um, so we kind of go through all this. Um, oh, there's this, this reference again. Um, Pittman, Koopman, Darmois theorem that uh, exponential family is the only family of distributions with finite sufficient statistics, uh, which means a size independent of the size of the data set. Uh, so that's the Wikipedia page to check for that claim, I guess. Um, so yeah, then they show how to compute the, the MLE. Uh, you take the logarithm, you take the derivative of that, uh, you set it to zero and solve, and you get these kinds of things, um, which ends up uh, so-called moment matching. So basically, you can uh, calculate the moments and uh, go backwards to, to uh, solve this thing. So for, Ber for Bernoulli, for example, uh, the, the, the mean, the, the probability of getting a heads on a coin flip is uh, one over n times uh, the number of heads that you got in your sample. So, yeah. Uh, next thing they want to talk about is a slight extension, uh, exponential dispersion family, uh, where now it's picked up this extra dispersion parameter. Uh, so when it's fixed, this is the natural exponential, and otherwise it's a thing that you can uh, let let float around, um, and we do maximum entropy. Uh, da, da, da. So if we have a uniform prior, minimizing KL divergence is equivalent to maximizing the entropy. Section 5.2, and that gets us the maximum entropy model. And then some derivations there. Uh, but probably we'll be seeing this more in section five. And then punchline. Uh, Normalization constant is this, which is the exactly the form of the exponential family, where it's the vector of sufficient statistics, natural parameters, and base measure. So very cool. Next, we get what he calls transformations of random variables. Um, I would I would typically call these functions of random variables. I think if you're like looking for things on the internet, that's probably uh, better thing to Google for. Um, he starts like, again, very broadly. So he's just like talking about functions and then he'll, he'll like talk about affine transformations as a special case, if I recall correctly. So um, so here's, here's how you do your kind of uh, change of variables thing uh, with the Jacobian. It's again, been, been a while since I had that kind of problem set. Uh, Andy says, if it's triangular, the determinant is easy to find. Uh, but you never want to compute determinants if you can avoid it. So then there's ways of uh, approximating it. So you can use a Monte Carlo approximation. Uh, let's see. 
this I think I learned as a different name. I think I learned this as method of inverse CDF. So just a quick question about the notation. Yep. yep. So at the very beginning of section 2.5.3, second yep. sentence, he says, let- 2.5.3, yeah. Yeah, so right where you are, right in the middle there, it says let, I don't know, it looks like y of x equal p sub x of x be a transformation of x. Right. Uh, that's, I, I don't know, maybe I should understand this, but how is he using p sub x to apply it to x? So, um, in his notation, uh, px is the CDF, the cumulative distribution function. Uh, and so that means if y equals that thing, that has a uniform zero one distribution, right? So for, um, and you can use this to kind of uh, transform any one, one distribution into any other distribution. So method of inverse CDF is, Again, the part that I remembered anyway, but basically like all CDFs look the same, right? They're kind of like, they start start over here at zero, they go up to, to one over here, and there's like a, a line that like goes up. So this is like all CDFs are the same. So if we're like, uh, you know, maybe this is like, I don't know, zero to a hundred or something like that. But over here, um, you know, th this goes from zero to one, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, kind of the... Right, so where the CDF know, is steep, that's likely like a mode of the, of the PDF, you know? Right, right. So yeah, ba basically when it's steeper or whatever, then it stretches things out and you end up with, uh, you know, if our, if our input X is like, I don't know, I really scrunched over here and then there's like one over here. It comes out uniformly dis distributed over here. Um, so, I mean, uh, that's kind of the, the trick, I guess, I don't know. But it is kind of like a, something that does come up. So, just one comment. So, yeah. 2.51, is, yep. uh, is that the only method where it is in a closed form? I guess, right? Well, it's expensive, but still, that's the only one when it's a bijection. Then you have a closed form. Yeah, the 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 one to one part is important, I think. Yeah, and two five three can get tricky. If, uh, I mean, it's there's no uh, closed form. It's just that you have to calculate for every y. Uh, in two yeah. So uh, un unless you have like a a nice. Uh, uh, PX, if it's nice, then then it's easy to work with. But in general, it could be some some weird thing because this this is just on random variables. It's not just like exponential family random variables, right? It's uh, th this works on uh, everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it depends on the transformation as well, right? So if it's a uh, complex transformation, then maybe hard or uh, i don't know uh, i'm just thinking out loud that, because i know that you know right, been, right. Uh, so um, so if, if you're over here um and you have like a if you have something that goes from i don't know if you square. have something that goes from r3 to like c2 or something like that like that that is simple. like could be or one simple. to one and it could be okay or it could be bad yeah or a simple or a simple one, like, you know, just square the the values, right? So from right. R to R, but just squaring it. So then how does the new trans the transformed variable distribution look like? Right. So, uh, yeah, so he's got some examples up here, I think, of the, oh yeah, so this is the probability integral transform, so so here we've got the PDF of different X's. Uh, CDF of Y is always uniform. It's that straight line. 
and then uh, and then these are samples. So if we sample from this thing and then do the 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 PI transform, then we should get a uniform thing plus or minus. So, works. Um, oh, other thing that they call out is the KS test. This is something I've used in the past. Uh, and so basically you plot the, the CDFs of the samples in a theoretical one. Uh, so like if you have like, uh, you know, so if this is like my, my actual data and then you know, the, the theorized one is like this or whatever, you find the biggest gap between those two curves. Uh, and that has a, a known distribution that you can test it against. Um, so, yep. And then, yeah, we'll just try and keep rolling through this and try and close out this chapter. We'll see. Uh, so then he totally changes gears and goes into Markov chains. <laughs> Um, and so with Markov chains, all the important stuff happens in the subscripts. So this might be a little hard to see on camera. Sorry about that. Uh, but the important thing with these is the Markov assumption, which is that the only history you need to remember is the last time point. Um, and so saying the sufficient statistic for predicting the future given the past is just the present. And that has some nice implications. Um, so if that's true, then you can imagine doing these like long chain rule type things for uh, for a joint probability. And it's kind of like uh, telescopes this way, uh, or we can just write it using the pi notation. Um, so these things uh, come up quite a bit. Uh, then we talk about uh, using different uh, different ways of parameterizing these things. Um, so if this function does not depend on the t itself, that's homogeneous or stationary or time invariant. Uh, or if it does depend on the t, then it's uh, dynamic. Uh, and he talks about uh, when the variables are discrete, we can call this a finite state Markov train. And then we can uh, fully specify the conditional distribution using a transition matrix. Uh, and I'm off the bottom again. Uh, an important thing is each, each row of the matrix sums to one. So that's, that's cool. Uh, and we can represent those as these little state space, state transition diagrams. Um, yeah, this is the kind of thing that ended up getting turned into like page rank for, uh, for Google search. So definitely a real world, uh, useful thing. Um, other thing that I've, I've used these for in demography, uh, if you had like a population with different age groups, uh, each column is a different age group. And then, uh, you know, your your mortality coefficients uh, or your probability of surviving end up on the, the upper diagonals. That's a thing that you see sometimes. Um, yeah. What else? OK, higher order ones. So this is like kind of a generalization so that instead of uh, only needing to remember um, one time point of history, maybe you remember two time points of history or three or however many. Um, so if you're like using this to like generate text, it ends up being like bigrams, trigrams, n-grams. Uh, so that's like the, the most basic language model. Um, I don't have too much to say about those other than that's also like a typical like a uh, problem set problem of like make a poetry generator using bigrams or trigrams. Uh, yep. Then he gets into MLE for these things. Uh, nothing too fancy here because it just ends up being counts. See, we just got 
uh, our predicted, our MLEs of the proportions are just the, the n's over the sums. So uh, yeah, but this is great because if you're on Hadoop, what's the example everyone learns? Word count, plug in the counts, and you're doing big data. Cool. Actually, you, you might just go back to the matrix image. I'm not sure if everyone here has seen these matrices. Oh, these guys up here? Yeah, yeah. So um, this is essentially like a frequency of how two letters appear in a text. And um, you can use this for the way you generate a, a, a text out of this is basically you take each row and think of it as the probability. So let's say you start with the letter A. So you go to the uh, you go to the row where A is, and you take that frequency and you normalize it, and you you yep. sample from it, and yep. say you get A is followed by C, and you know yep. the high probability. And you do this every time. So you go to to row C and you generate it, and you look you sample from it, and you and this is how you the simplest generation of. Of a, of a language model is really right. through this frequency histogram. Right. Uh, it's a really cool exercise to practice if you, if in practice if you haven't done it. Yeah. Um, all you really need is like a 26 by 26 matrix. So it's, uh, you could do this on your calculator if you wanted to. Um, yeah. And, and this also shows like if you were to do like a trigram model, you can quickly see. Right how much this explodes and that this is where the curse of dimensionality comes up. Right. Um, the other thing that you can notice from these matrices is the, how sparse they are. Um, right. yeah, and this is like something nothing right there. Yeah. So just from practical practice and then machine learning generative model. It's good. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna skip these parts and just call out the stationarity part. This is like a important, I don't know, vocab word, <laughs> right? So uh, stationarity means that, uh, you know, the distribution is not changing over time. So you'll see this word come up if you're like looking at like time series, for example. Um, and there's kind of a formal distribution over here. Um, so if you have an initial distribution, it'll change over time. Uh, but when it's stationary, uh, stays the same. And then you can compute this where you get the eigenvector because these things always pop up. Um, so that's the trick there. Uh, and, you know, You've probably seen like the eigen system stuff before, but it I'm always just kind of amazed when they pop up. Um, and every time that's a new application, I feel like I learn a little. So it's worth worth calling that out, I think. Um, but this is not guaranteed to to exist. So if you have uh, an irreducible chain, um, then it won't. Um, there's the definition of the limiting distribution. Um, so kind of go through some, some more vocab. So basically all functions either like uh, converge, diverge, or cycle, right? Same thing kind of applies to uh, distributions converging. So kind of talks through that and Uh, some more more theorems around that. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, detailed balance. This will come up later uh, when we talk about MCMC. Because this is like what you need for like your uh, your kind of old school stamp samplers. Um, so we'll just put a note there. Um, so detailed balance equations. So. This is like, uh, again, like all the important stuff is in the subscripts, but here we have pi i a i j equals pi j a j i. It's like the subscript flipped around, but that's that's what reversible means. Um, 
Yeah. Then it uh, <laughs> changes topics kind of again to like uh, divergence measures between probability distributions. Uh, so these are used uh, in a lot of ways. If you wanted to kind of derive hypotheses tests or things like that, you need these. If you want goodness of fit tests, you need need them. Uh, so he kind of goes through uh, several. F divergence is not one I've uh, encountered, or at least not written this way. Uh, but he's got a couple more. KL divergence is one I definitely have. Um, it's got the the log right there. Um, alpha divergence. Uh, so it's, it seems that F divergence is the generalization, right? And KL is a specific. Uh, uh, seems yeah, like when F R equals R log R, then that's KL. Yeah, yeah. So if, if the F is, yeah, R log R, then, then yeah. Um, so this is a special case. Uh, alpha divergence is not one that I've... Uh, encountered just looking at the citations it seems like it's it's a bit more modern because the, these citations are like 0905 so don't know if it's been adopted very much um, ellinger distance um so this is kind of like a square root of a product so this is like a harmonic kind of thing um Chi square distance. Uh, so this could use for um, th this looks very similar to like LRTs because we've got the difference of some some guys up here. Um, don't know integral integral probability metrics either. Uh, that's also 2009, so pretty new. Um, let's see. And they use something called a witness function. See, see illustration. Okay. Let's just look at the illustration because we've got like six minutes. <laughs> um, smooth witness function for comparing two distributions which are different and similar. Okay. So this is witness function that looks different, and then this is a witness function for their similar. Okay. And then we've got MMD, which uses samples from two distributions. Samples are compared using positive definite kernels, C section 18.2. Uh, so, so we'll get um, there. Neil, on yep. the 2.72 integral probability metrics, uh -huh. so it says that on page 58, that, mm -hmm. which is, an, uh, yeah, right there. That IPM in this case is equal to Wasserstein one distance, which is the earth mover distance. Is that what it is, right? Uh, yeah, so it looks like they're yeah. taking the expected value uh, under two different uh, distributions. Yeah. Yeah, I think with that function, it becomes the earth mover's distance. Yeah. Hmm. And that's something that is. Uh, used in some uh, loss measurements, it seems. Okay. Uh, uh, there's this Wasserstein GAN or something that is used as well. Okay. W GAN, uh, which, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, so we may not know all the uses yet, but I guess part of the reason why you make sure to mention these things is because they're gonna come up later. Right, yeah, lots of... Uh... Lots of forward references, which is uh, which is fine. Yeah, and I have I have seen MMD uh, okay. being used a lot more in the last year or two. Okay, uh, I hadn't seen the use use of MMD as the uh, last measure till maybe two years ago. I, I mean, of course, it exists, but hadn't seen it being used that often or commonly it's a seduction is definitely going up apparently yeah well over here it says that mmd you can calculate using the kernel trick which uh 
looks like these parts. So that means it's like uh, you're able to kind of do calculations on a smaller dimensionality. Uh, so they rewrite it using these Ks. Um, and as you can see also from the references, sorry, not to derail you for the next yeah. few minutes, uh, but the references also point towards like 2012 or later mm -hmm. uh, references. So this is maybe some, some of the development is quite new in, in this area. Yeah, it's probably after uh, after I went to industry and quit quit learning fun stuff. Uh, let's see, let's see what's else, what's left. There was uh, oh, so there's a a thing about choosing the right kernel, which uh, I've seen these kinds of discussions like with support vector machines. I haven't thought about that's like a a judgment call you'll have to make for your for your divergence metrics now. That's kind of interesting. And then uh, last page. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Neil, quick quick yeah. comment on that. Yeah. I just love the way he just throws this in. What page are we on here? Is this 59 or? But anyway, yeah. at the bottom yeah. of, of this page, he's like, oh, by the way, this, this kernel inception distance, it's, it's better than FID, which like everybody in computer vision is using, but just, you know, whatever, it's better. Hmm. <laughs> Well, there you go. I mean, it's like every paper you read in computer vision, they use FID. And I've never seen anybody use kernel inception distance. Maybe they have, but it's just like, oh, yeah, and by the way, you know, better, uh, they, similar, do, they use that in the Gaussian processes when they have to uh, define what kernel they want to use for the Gaussian processes. So they, I've seen that being used there. Okay. But yes, it's not as common as FID. I just think it's hilarious because like there's like 8 billion FID references. So here we're in the first chapter of the book and he's just like saying, oh, by the way, if you were smart, you'd use this instead of FID. I mean, he doesn't word it that way, but that's the way I took it. Right. I mean, he kind of says that it's like nicer statistical properties and better correlated with human perceptual judgment. <laughs> why, why wouldn't you use it? Um, okay, and so then he's got this kind of chart, which I think helps situate these things a little bit. So we've got our integral probability metrics and we've got our divergences and then some, some different things that we could choose inside of there. Um, and then the total variation distance is both. Uh, so there we go. And also we can do density ratio estimation using a binary classifier. So that's neat too. It's the DRE trick. Uh, and then last page, 7.30, I don't wanna hold people here too long. So this also looks a little uh, formula-y. I don't have much to add here. <laughs> um, so sorry about that, you all. It's uh, that's this chapter, but we we did do it. <laughs> yeah, that was that was awesome. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, uh, I'll just add on this last topic. Um, um, you know, I've seen people just practically, you know, when when they're looking at uh, um, they've got a model and they're trying to see if the if there's like distribution shift or something like that, right? One of the simple things they do is they just build a classifier if they could tell and and so i thought that this was like a lot of theory but it kind of you know reminds me of just practically that's like an easy test you can do and so yeah. perhaps you are actually computing some kl divergence and you don't realize it because you're using logistic regression but you know there you go <laughs> yeah you're um, right I, now that you mentioned it that's something i've done where you just uh you know, take a pre-post thing, dump it through a random forest, and if it picks up on something, you know it changed. Yeah. 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 Um, and then I, I feel I'd be remiss without mentioning just two things. So one is I finally got to the end of the chapter and I noticed, holy cow, that's equation 316. So I thought that <laughs> that was worth noting. And then the other thing is, if you look, there's a footnote at the very la bottom of the last page of the chapter, and he's like, Oh, and by the way, if you use this technique, you could basically recover the whole concept of a GAN. 
it's like it's like if you just use this then you would have like thought of doing the gam yourself before you know goodfellow did <laughs> yeah there you go yeah. yeah he was a little light on uh he, lots of references and fewer footnotes in this chapter compared to the the first section but uh there's definitely plenty of those if you want to follow up on some of the references that are in there um yeah and it's just kind of jumping around a lot it's, it makes it a little hard for me to follow but that's okay um you just kind of got to roll with it and and like you say i think if you got like two-thirds three quarters of this you're doing pretty good i'm probably like around there <laughs> so yeah awesome all right well i hope I hope this was good for people. Um, uh, again, uh, thanks for the questions. Thanks for the people who chimed in, the engagement, the stuff in the chat. Uh, again, the, the, the point of this is to try and crowdsource. Um, and so then huge thank you to Neil for doing a lot of the heavy lifting to kind of prep for today. So for next week, we're going to go into the next chapter, chapter three, which is statistics. Um, I have not read the whole chapter yet. I haven't read ahead. Um, Roger, I, I misspoke who was doing what order last week, by the way. So Neil obviously did this week. Roger's doing next week. And it's a, it's a long chapter, and he doesn't have the benefit of me having already done sections one and two. So pretty high probability we're not going to finish chapter three. But at any rate, see, see how much of chapter three you guys can read um, before next week. That was really great, you guys. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for, for coming. It's, uh, it's always a little daunting when there's like 30 people on the Zoom and you're just trying to cover some material or whatever. You can't really read the room. But, you know, thank you all. Thank you for not Zoom bombing or whatever. Um, <laughs> what is Zoom bombing? I'm sorry, I have to ask. I just, I've never uh, just just noisy people doing inappropriate things. Just ah, okay. Of Bad Zoom behavior. Mm -hmm. You'll know when you see you on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. Um, reminder, we have Slack. So if there's any comments, questions, additional things, um, you can share it in our uh, book club channel, ML Book Club channel. And otherwise, hope to see you guys next week. Awesome. Right. Yeah, chapter Bye. three is is ninety pages. You're not making it through in in a week. We'll we'll get get a good chunk of it. Yeah, I told yeah. Roger at least half. My goal is at least no more than two weeks. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, you all have a good one. Bye. All right. Awesome. Thanks yeah, again, I'll Neil. See you guys on Tuesday. Thank you so much. Really great. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye guys. See you.